Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it, Midweek Editions here at Tail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Hope you do it all right. We got a lot to get to. Plenty of MLB to talk about. The Dodgers' decision on Kershaw. What will Aaron Judge do? Our MLB insider and Husker and World Series champ, Jabba Chamberlain. Coming up in Hour 2, we'll get the lowdown on the wide receiver room and roll for this Nebraska offense Coming up also in Hour 2, Brandon Kenny, standout Husker wideout, will be with us. Uh, in this first hour, Mike Shuhard will talk to Shuey about some of the talent that has come through Wilderness Ridge on their way to Augusta. Excited to talk with Shuey. He's probably still out on the course uh, putting for dough. And in about 20 minutes, uh, Mr. Husker football himself. Mike Babcock will be with us. Numbers for you to get in, 466-3776-4667-76-80-825-5865. If you're hearing us outside of Lincoln around the state, toll-free number 800-825-5865. can email chris or at hailvarsity.com and always Find and follow on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio. Chris Schmidt, that's me, Elijah Herbal, at Herbal Essence on Twitter. What do you know? What are you thinking? Are you glad you're not umping today? Well, uh, after seeing some of the, the things that have been coming out on social media over the past couple of days, have you seen some of these videos and pictures? Where there was a uh, a softball umpire. Oh, you had a you had a female ump yeah. that got jacked uh, right orbital bone, yeah. got punched. You've got another ump that got shoved down, yeah, down I in saw on, uh, down in Texas on Facebook. That was a game of 11-year-olds. Uh, I <laughs> heard uh, about some crazy AAU altercations between refs and crazy parents. Now, we do have one member of our friend group that, that was launched at a basketball game. Mm. But it was not physical at all. It was just questioning... You know, there, there are both ends of the floor to blow the whistle on. Mm. And she may have gone a little bit over the line, but it's okay. I think my dad once got tossed from a small fry game <laughs> <laughs> that my brother was playing in. Uh, and it was, I feel bad. The guy's nickname was Jeff the Ref. He had the coolest sideburns ever. He was just out there sweating and trying to help out eight or 10 year olds, whatever, you know, the age group is for small fry. Up there on North 27th, uh, Salvation Army. Loved that league. Never got to make a team, but my brother was good enough to. So, yeah, it's not like that's foreign, but it's gotten a little worse. See, I've never crossed the line of tossing a fan. Like, if there's a fan that's being that much of a problem, I'll, I'll go to the, the dugout of whichever fan it would appear that, uh, that, that that fan is supporting whatever team. Go to the dugout, talk to the head coach, say, hey, if you don't get that fan to shut up, it's you on the line. I'm going to toss you. So you figure it out. Either talk to their kid. How many times have kid. you done that? Only once. Yeah. I mean, you're a pretty high tolerance guy. Yeah. And, it, and it, you're competent. It, it pretty quickly stopped that fan whenever the head coach was now in line saying, if you don't shut up. But I just don't understand why someone wants to pick a fight with somebody who's wearing a chest protector and mask and all this gear. Like, you're not going to win that. Well, it's just it's just Bush League. And, and you you have you'll, people follow, you'll have people following you to your car. Uh, it, listen, uh, I know I pile on refs from time to time, but they are, in all honesty, well, clearly necessary, but they're out there doing it, and they're not getting rich. They love the game. So take a take a breath and, and hit the brakes a little bit. So we will uh, get uh, all around the, uh, the, the four food groups of sport today. Interesting stuff on Dabo Sweetie as well. Is is he going to dig his heels in when it comes to the portal, uh, or will he will he have to adapt uh, or or die? And what I mean by that is, you know, what's up with Clemson? There's a lot of programs that have made the list here on ESPN.com's rundown here 
Story out today, five college football teams that need big 2023 recruiting classes. And, you know, this isn't the first time Nebraska has found their name in a really good peer group, but for different reasons, right? You'll, you'll see Nebraska in the Blue Blood discussion. You'll talk about dominance. You'll look at positions of strength, you know, who's put the most NFL dudes out there at rush end or linebacker, wide receiver, quarterback. I mean, you can get into some of these offseason topics where Nebraska is still really strong. But you have a list of teams here that are listed by ESPN, USC, Clemson, Nebraska, Florida, and Auburn. A word or two to sum up why they're all on the list. Well, USC is, they got to get back to glory. Clemson. They need to maintain their power. 10-3 and three in the top 25s. Fine, they've lived in the college football playoff most of the last six seasons. They've been in the top five. Dabo Sweeney's taken them to an elite football program. They lost a ton, and they played young guys, and it showed. Nebraska just needs to win, right? Nebraska needs to win football games. Nebraska needs to be bowl eligible. Nebraska needs to be in contention for the Big Ten West. Nebraska needs to get back to Indy for a Big Ten championship opportunity. Nebraska needs to start being Nebraska again. And it really hurt last year despite the effort and how great the games were as far as not being blown out, right? What was was the argument? Talking to somebody uh, the other day and they're like, you know, we share uh, season tickets with with another buddy that's, that's also got a business. And you know, back in the bow era, we were all bitching and moaning about going nine and four every year. We would kill for the right. I mean, look, look at, look at, look at history. And yeah, you had some embarrassing losses that were part of the four loss seasons. But you beat who you felt like by your birthright you were supposed to beat. So Nebraska on this list because they need to get back to winning. Florida turnover. Another coaching ejection, another coaching change. Is this this the right move for the Gators? And they were pretty successful, but not Spurrier great or Urban great. So, well, better better make a change. And then there's Auburn. <laughs> and, and and well, you know Auburn's Auburn's their own worst enemy because their boosters are psycho. They they ran out a coach that that beat Saban and Gus. And then Chizik, Chizik, whether it was fool's gold or not, at least delivered Cam Newton, delivered Cam's daddy, probably delivered a bag of money, allegedly, <laughs> and, and at least delivered a national championship and played for another. Gus did. I think Auburn's played for three in the last 12 years. They won one with Cam. So there's your rundown. USC's recruiting class finished 52nd uh, in a – quick turnaround Lincoln Riley addition to Hollywood and they've done pretty well so these schools need big recruiting classes for 2023 as we focus in on Nebraska Elijah uh, the thought is this with Nebraska you've got Frost who's made some significant changes to his staff and the insinuation is he's running out of time to get the program on track the recruiting class finished 61st in class rankings in 2022 uh, with only three recruits ranked as four stars. Not part of that, though, is what Nebraska did from a supplemental draft standpoint, i.e. the portal, and Nebraska finished 10th by most accounts in the portal. So just because you don't do well with, with your high school acquisitions doesn't mean you can't here and now immediately fix with the portal. But here is your reality. Your high school talent is still your foundation. Your portal is your eraser. What do you evaluate? How do you evaluate? How do you develop? And can you get guys ready to plug and play or at least ease into a starting spot or a contributor spot and pray they become stars? To me, Nebraska's recruiting rankings have been good. They were decent in the Bow era. They were really pretty decent in the Riley era. They've been good. I know Scott finished in the – this is what's incredible. Uh, While you're juggling a perfect season and you take over Nebraska, you still finish 18th 
uh, on on paper. But Nebraska's problem's been attrition, and they're not unique to that. They've Nebraska, along with other places, have lost a lot of talent. It just feels like it hurts more in Lincoln. Uh, and to me, find your blueprint. Nebraska is kind of redefining their blueprint blueprint offensively with what they want to do with Whipple. So, so find a kids that can play, you think can play. Find a kid you can develop to play, and then find me kids that'll stay, right? I mean, that's kind of your rundown with your high school talent. And if, if kids opt elsewhere, which is more the trend than ever, then be able to have a go-to in the portal. I think Nebraska's got a good one-two punch with the shift in staff. I think you're always going to have a strong uh, Sun Belt region recruiting wise with Travis Fisher and Coach Beckman. Okay, Beckton. Both those guys are are locked in in Georgia and Florida, and they'll bring you the talent. Your job's to keep them here and develop them if they're not position group guys for either tight end or defensive back. I think Mike Dawson's a very good developer, has contacts in the East Coast. We don't know a lot about Riola. But it sounds like he's connected well with the kids he has on the offensive line. And there's a, there's a certain persona and profile Raiola is going to look at. It may not be sexy on paper, but theoretically, by the time he's done with them, they'll be good football players. At the skill spot, you got nobody better than Mickey Joseph at evaluating talent, connecting with the talent, and dealing with some diva talent. Quite honestly, I mean, the wide receiver group, I mean, Brandon Kenny would be the first to say, yeah, wide outs are divas. He is not, but but many are, right? So it's about role acceptance there. Running back room, Coach Applewhite will get you back into Texas and can really scout out some good ball players and then make them uh, hit that ceiling from a talent standpoint. And you got a new quarterback coach, right? I mean, Nebraska's had the uh, the run of Adrian, and maybe a different set of eyes will be a good thing when it comes to who comes into town and gets a look at quarterback, and then will stay with Whipple based on his pedigree. So I think Nebraska will be all right. And from a portal standpoint, between guys that may be looking to opt out of SEC land, uh, Mickey's connected there, also Bill Bush. Bill Bush is so good at finding high school talent and being right with projecting with what some talent can be. And, and listen, Prince of Mukamara and Alex Smith were not super household names. You go back in time, they're probably both top 20 recruits. At the time, they were three stars. And Prince, a first-round pick, and Alex Smith, the first pick overall, really good NFL career, uh, a Pro Bowl guy. So uh, Bush is and, – and then you look at the Burrow story from Ohio State to LSU – that's a nice transfer slash portal when it was pre-portal, but you get my point. So I think Nebraska's set up. Now they need to win this year, but Nebraska's set up to kind of get better at, at being right and develop. I can't prove that. That's just my gut right now with the, the changes they've made. Uh, from a high school standpoint, the foundation, and then uh, sprinkling in uh, some whiteout slash erase some of the, the departures or if you missed. So I think that's that's where Nebraska is at. That's how I feel, and I'm glad they're included on this list because this, this list because ESPN and wrong, Nebraska needs to be good uh, at that foundational part. Can you get a good 2023 class on top of what you've already brought in? And then, hey, win some games, get some momentum, and kind of get back on track. Yeah, and the foundation – I mean, you, you mentioned all the things about attrition and whatnot, but the foundation essentially has been built, especially offensively, for a different coaching staff. That's why uh, when you bring constantly, these, right? And, and that's, it's just been it's been shifting sand below your feet, man. And that's what I mean. These transfer portal guys are coming in, and they're the band aids. They're the you know they're going to throw in some different looking bricks into the foundation uh, to make it all work out. And that's why 2023 is now so important because you're setting the foundation for a new coaching staff, which may not be uh, as impactful next football season, but come three, four years down the road, it's the foundation which is you're going to build the house upon. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, nothing is, is wrong about this article. Nebraska, yeah, the 2023 class is probably as crucial as any class since Scott Frost's first year at Nebraska. Don't disagree. And, and that, that first class in Lincoln, while a good again good on paper, how many of those guys are still around? How many guys have contributed? How many guys have thrived? 
I mean, Nebraska, you got a guy gotten it out in, in Smothers. We'll see where he can go. But you've gone to go get a Casey Thompson. You've gone to go get a Chubba Pretty. Uh, you have a Harburg that that you did recruit, and he's still in the program. You still have Torres. You're hoping, like God, to, to get uh, Dylan Riola continued to stay locked in and engaged with Nebraska, and that should be – Nebraska should stay in that conversation despite the other more well-known suitors. But you've just you, – you've, you've messed up at quarterback. And you didn't mess up with Adrian. You just didn't get a break with injury – and things around Adrian. What you did ask of Adrian was probably too much because you didn't have anything to really help him out a ton post that first season, be it offensive line or running game or some go-to guys at wide receiver. I mean, it's not that you didn't have Spielman or or a Wandale. Both guys were talented. Wandale's going to get drafted here in about three weeks. But you were using him in a different way because you had screwed up at running back. I think the problem with that first class was rather than being a foundation for the future for Nebraska, it became a, a band-aid class for what the Mike Riley staff said had left behind. Well, and you get you listen, you move into a new uh, neighborhood, right? I.e., you take this job over. What was the receiver room like? I mean, you had to go try and fill those positions. We'll talk some ball here with Mike Babcock at Hale Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. <laughs> Hello, listener. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity Radio, and I wanted to let you know about a special deal just for listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast. We're offering $10 off the annual subscription price of $29.99. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we do. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe promo code GBR. And we're back. Fellas, I think we could listen to the radio listen? On Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Back to it. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. And so are, are the phones like dead? It would appear to be. I, I'm, I'm working on it right now. I, I may go. No, that's, that's it, all right. I'm just like, all right, now pot up the thing. So you can't dial out where you're at, huh? Now I can try. Okay. Yeah. Again, Velvet Hammer analog lines. On the next, I'm kidding. So, uh, we have dove into uh, the ESPN recruiting article, five teams that have to have big 2023 seasons on the recruiting trail, SC, Clemson, Nebraska, Florida, Auburn. I think you're in in agreement as a Nebraska fan that recruiting is big time. We welcome in uh, Mike Babcock, HaleVarsity.com and Magazine, at MD Babs on Twitter. Babbers, a lot going on in uh, post-spring game, so you've got a little downtime before summer workouts going on. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I'm doing all right. I'm going to see that uh, Loyola documentary tonight. Oh, that'll be good. Yeah, that's 63. I was, I was a Jerry Harkness fan. Okay. Because I read all the college basketball magazines. I don't think I ever saw him play until the uh, NCAA tournament finals, but... Well, I, the college basketball and college football magazines were a staple, and you uh, helped write some of those. And uh, I remember, man, uh, having to have, like, sinus surgery as a junior high kid. <laughs> and uh, Johnny Mitchell's on the cover, and I'm reading about the, the 1990 Nebraska, 1991 Nebraska football teams. And, yeah, it helped pass the time when there was no tablet or phone to stare at for endless hours. Oh, I was a big, uh, I was a big magazine, football and basketball college. That was really a significant uh, thing for me, going way back. I mean, Elgin Baylor, when he was playing at Seattle, he was. I, I saw him in the magazines that I read about him, and he was my favorite player. Has, has always been my favorite NBA player. That's really cool. Babbers, uh, Bob Devaney would have been 107 today, and. Uh, 
you ever get to attend a Bob Devaney birthday party? I know you did his biography with you and some some other colleagues. No, never, never a birthday party. Um, you know, there were a couple of functions that uh, you know he and Tom, uh, you know, the two coaches mm-hmm. that had back to back hundred plus uh, victories. Um, that was pretty cool. And then you know, doing the book, I probably told you this story before, but. Uh, at least once or twice, uh, we went over to Bob's house to do the interviews. And uh, one time, I can remember, he, he didn't want to start the interview till Hogan's Heroes was over. So I never heard this. Uh, I never heard this. Great we show. were sitting in, the, in Bob's basement watching Hogan's Heroes, and I, I don't. I'm, I'm probably putting two memories together, but uh, Phyllis uh, made some uh, chocolate chip cookies. Okay. And uh, you know, Virgil and Randy and I and Bob uh, ate chocolate chip cookies. So putting those memories together, if they didn't happen exactly that way, um, uh, sitting in Bob's basement watching Hogan's Heroes and eating chocolate chip cookies, that's a a pretty good good memory for for a Hall of Fame coach. He was a very engaging guy. Well, that's that's really cool. How are the chocolate chip cookies? Pretty awesome. Oh, they were very good. They mm-hmm. were very good. Mike, um, I you know that 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 would have been a a place to be, <laughs> watching you know, sitcoms and, and eating chocolate chip cookies. And you know, it's it's funny. I think the whole time that Bob, uh, you know, coached here, he lived at the same address, and you could basically go up to the knock on the door. He he, he wouldn't be there, but. Um, yeah, it was it was a different time, obviously, a different time and place. Probably couldn't do that now. Not not likely. Uh, Mike Babcock's with us from Hale Varsity. Mike, uh, a thought on on the spring game and and just overall kind of the the mood here as Nebraska heads to another phase here with summer. Well, you know, it's really it's really difficult because uh, you know of the obvious that the first half was just uh, touch football and. And when they played real football, it was the reserves. You know that was that was interesting. And it, and it, even though it wasn't close to the record, um, you know fifty well fifty four thousand or fifty five thousand. That that's pretty good uh, attendance. Uh, you know it shows the passion of of Husker fans. And I you know I think that that's that's one of the things that's always a attracted me to the job that I do is the passion of the fans. And you you still saw it there. You know, they showed up. It wasn't really a game for the first half, and all these people are, are there uh, supporting the Huskers, and I thought that was a – I thought that was a good – that was a good sign, you know, that uh, people are still passionate about it enough to, to show up for something like that. But, um, you know, from the standpoint of uh, – I'm not that smart. And if you're just playing touch football, it makes it even more difficult for me to make, draw any conclusions about, you know, who's where. The one thing that I would say that you've indicated, too, uh, Casey Thompson is probably going to be the guy because he was the first guy out there. And, um, you know, we go back to what Mark Whipple said the first day of spring practice, who took the first snap. Um, Casey did. So um, we probably saw that. We probably saw the the top three on the depth chart quarterbacks um, because they didn't they weren't involved in the in the second half so you know maybe we learn things like that but uh, basically it was just to get a, get out for the fans and to see the players out on the field and see some former players come back and uh, everything that is a part of the spring game. Mike, we were talking a little bit Monday about how, how you could make the spring game more entertaining. Because it's been a couple years now of, of touch football in the first half, and it hasn't been the most exciting thing in the world for fans to watch. And I know that there's been discussion around the NFL Pro Bowl. They don't want to have too much contact there either. They've been talking about maybe making that a, a flag football game, and I'm, I'm not suggesting doing that for the spring game here, but do you have any suggestions, any thoughts on how to make the spring game more exciting for the fans moving forward, or, or, or is that not the point? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's tough, Elijah, and I think the, the big thing is, obviously, with uh, everything's televised now and, and uh, social media and so forth, and so you don't want to show anything, you know, like I, like I said, probably, you know, there, uh, Pat Fitzgerald could be sitting on his couch in the living room with the TV on watching on the Big Ten Network, 
you know, if, if Nebraska's out there doing things that it's it's going to do um, come fall, um, you're giving the opposition a chance to, to scout you or whatever. And, and uh, you know, Scott's played things pretty close to the vest all the way through. So it's going to be more and more difficult, I think, from that standpoint, unless, uh, you know, the fans enjoyed, I'm sure, the, watching some of the reserves go out there and, and play uh, – tackle football in the second half but um you know you want to you know scott said going in the obvious you know you want to come out of the spring that's one thing that you want to ensure in the spring game is you don't want to you don't want to jeopardize your um your top guys with the with the contract contact drills and it's the same thing in practice i mean you don't want to get too carried away because you got to keep those guys uh, healthy uh, so they're ready to go come fall. Mike Babcox with this Babbers, a thought here with recruiting, and we started off referencing ESPN's article where Nebraska's uh, making a, a list of schools that, that really need a good 2023, and you look at the, the quarterback spot, that, that recruit has been, that, that spot's been filled by Watson, the kid out of, out of Massachusetts. You have the Dylan Riola uh, courtship that continues by Nebraska and everybody the who's who of college football at quarterback and I got a question for you at that quarterback spot I mean is, is it imperative that Nebraska gets a a guy that can help right away at that quarterback spot I look at some some difference makers right you look at Trevor Lawrence you look at Micah Parsons, C.J. Stroud, Smith and Jigba, those are the guys that have played really early recently that have been wow guys. Uh, Tommy Frazier, you know, kind of a generation-changing quarterback for Nebraska uh, as a freshman halfway through his freshman season. And the the thing that I I think folks know, but maybe it's not a, a focal point, those guys are really good, and they're dropped in to, to do their role. But they've also been ushered into very old, established, talented teams. There's always been guys around some of these freshman phenoms that help make things go. Well, that's, you know, that's the key thing, I think, what you just said, is that you got veterans surrounding these guys. I mean, Adrian Martinez had a, had a really good uh, freshman year and when he came team. in. <laughs> uh, Taylor Martinez did. Um, think about that. Um, and like you said, Tommy Fraser. It, it's good if you if you can if, but you have to have the guys around him to be able to to be able to accomplish the kind of things that that you want to have. Um, yeah, it's a good. Here, here's an interesting story, kind of a sidelight, but um, Turner Gill had an opportunity to be with the varsity on a regular basis when he was a freshman and opted to stay with the freshman team mm. um, because he didn't feel like he was ready, um, which is a sign of a pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, it's some self awareness, isn't it? Player, yeah, uh, and and we know what. I mean, he was a he was a, a game changing quarterback. You know, I think that he was the where Nebraska made that transition because he could have been a great quarterback, just a drop back guy. Uh, that he or he, you know, he could he could run the option, and uh, that's kind of where things changed a little bit. But you think about the guys that were around. Uh, a Turner Gill, or you think about the guys that that uh, need to be around uh, and probably weren't um, Adrian Martinez. I mean, he did a lot of things um, that he probably shouldn't have had to do mm-hmm. uh, in that first year. But uh, by the same token, uh, in, in, to some degree, uh, and this might be a, a poor analogy, but to some degree it always seems to me like so you get a young quarterback in there. He gets in there and he has immediate success, okay? It's kind of like in baseball, like a pitcher. You go through the lineup one time, and then you go through the second time maybe, or the third time for sure, and they have a little bit better sense of that pitcher, you know, and you mm-hmm. make adjustments, and as a, it becomes a game of adjusting. And I think that's the same way with a young quarterback. That first year, maybe you're able to do some things that you're maybe not going to be able to do that second year because defenses adjust, and then it's how you adjust that, that enables you to be uh, successful in that second or third year, whatever it is. 
Mike Babcock with us from Hale Varsity. Babbers, we'll check in next week, bud. Good chat. Thanks for a few minutes today. Thanks for having me, guys. Be yeah, safe. You too. Go get some chocolate chip cookies, bud. Mike Schuhart's on the way. Hale Varsity continues. Hello, listener. This is Brandon Vogel, managing editor of Hale Varsity. And I wanted to let you know about a special deal just for listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast. We're offering $10 off the annual subscription price of $29.99. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we produce. Ten issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all of the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe, promo code GBR. And we're back. Fellas, did we could... Listen to the radio listen. on Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes, that's awesome. More thoughts on the Husker wide receiver room. Uh, former Husker Brandon Kenny going to be with us. Java Chamberlain next hour to talk some MLB and some Husker baseball. Mike Shuhard with us, Wilderness Ridge Golf and Shuey. How about that Masters, bud? How you doing? I'm doing awesome. It never fails to deliver, man. Another spectacular Masters. It always is. That is uh, so on point. And I got to ask you, uh, with Wilderness Ridge, you've had a number of guys come through your course that have gone on to Augusta and and thrive. Not only Scheffler, not long removed, playing at Wilderness and then the Corn Ferry, but also Zalatoris. Touch on that a bit. You've seen a lot of guys tee off uh, that first tee box over at Wilderness that have gone on to, to great things. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, you know, watching those guys and, and uh, just kind of watching them. And you kind of kind of guess, I guess, and see. It's like, you know what, that guy's pretty good. That guy's got a chance. That guy's got a chance. And uh, it's pretty interesting that both of those guys, as you're just not really knowing who they are and watching them going, you know what, those guys – look like they have the game that will get them through. And those were two guys that I watched play, that it's like just watching them play out here that, you know, I thought had a chance. And sure enough, they end up doing what they're doing. So it's pretty cool. Do you have any interaction uh, much with uh, with uh, Zalatoris or Scheffler? No, not much. Just they, they come in, they kind of do their business, go about their business, get ready for what it is they're – getting ready to do, especially that. I mean, that's, that's a Q school. So it's like first stage of Q school. And it's like, if they want to get where they want to go, you know, they got to get through this stage to get to the next stage to get to the next stage. So they're pretty focused on, on what it is they're trying to accomplish. Mike, is there like one or two parts of someone's game where if they've got it, you know, that means that they're going to be pretty good someday, especially among young golfers is like anything with, how their swing looks, how they perform around the greens. Is there any part of a game that if someone has it, you know, man, that's going to mean good things for your future career? Well, uh, you got to have three things, you know, it's like you got to have length. So, you know, they, are they big and strong enough that they can, they can hit it far enough to be able to play the courses that they have to play. Um, you watch, I like to watch their mannerisms and how they play. You can tell a lot by that because, you know, those guys are, you can't really tell whether they're shooting 10 under or 10 over. They, they stay very even keeled about what they do. And that, that tells me a lot that they're, they're focused in on, on taking care of the shot that's in front of them and, you know, not being influenced by the shots that are behind them. And how good are, are, is their wedge game? You, know, you look at Scheffler this week. I mean, he hit – I mean, his pitching, chipping, and, and a bunch of the wet shots that he hit that basically won him the tournament, you know, because that's kind of the difference. I mean, you got to be really, uh, you got to have a sharp, short game, you know, because that's what keeps you in, in holes all the time. Uh, you know, it's hard to make bogeys when you can get it up down from everywhere. And he did this week better than anybody else. Mike, I think it's real easy to make bogeys and doubles. <laughs> 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 but but that's just me. Mike Schuart's with us, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Shuey, uh, a thought on Tiger, my friend. Uh, what did what did his completion mean to you? Uh, pretty amazing. I mean, I, I didn't think that he would make it 
I just thought it would be too grueling. But and you could tell it started taking a toll on him as the week went on. You know, trying to finish the last two rounds. But I think that was more of of him testing himself to see if that it was possible for him to do that, which he did. So he, he I think he crossed one hurdle. Uh, I see shortly after that that he decided not to play in the PGA. You know, because Southern Hills is going to be a very similar golf course as far as up and downs. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's going to save himself and, and get ready for um, St. Andrews, which is perfect because it's dead flat. You don't have to deal with as much up and downs, you know, so that's a little more time to get prepared for that. And it's going to be a lot easier golf course to physically handle for him. So, you know, I, there was talk at one time that he was going to play in the PGA, but he kind of shut that down pretty quick because I think he knew after playing that that he didn't have enough time and was quite ready for that type of terrain that he'd have to negotiate. negotiate. Shuey, what's your takeaway with uh, not only Scheffler but his his caddy, old Teddy Scott, got on Instagram and shows him pulling up in the driveway with the <laughs> 18th green flag hanging out the old back window of the Mazda compact. <laughs> Pretty funny. I mean, that's smart on, on Scheffler's part. I mean, he got, he got himself a very experienced caddy. Mm-hmm. That, that he relied a lot on, that he knew could help him. But from the caddy standpoint, I think that was, you know, because that's his third Masters that he's won, but I think this one's a little more special. But just because of who Shuffler is, mm-hmm. you know, he's just kind of a good old boy. Just loves to play golf and work and tries to see how good he can play and not a lot of drama and, and anything behind him. He just plays golf, you know. So I think that was – and he knows his family, and he's a family kid, and mm-hmm. and uh, I think he enjoyed that a little bit more just because of who he is, and, and happy for him that he won. Well, you had the the uh, flag placemats, and even a picture of the flag in, in the uh, the walk-in shower. So, yeah, it was uh, it was impressive. Shuey, uh, let's talk about Wilderness Ridge, the the swim up bar that I will be snorkeling in uh, the, uh, the the the. The course, the the practice facilities. I mean, talk to me here about where you're at with construction, and I know membership's booming, bud. Yeah, membership's are going crazy. People are getting excited because it's kind of like every day, every week, you start to see something new taking place. So they just started to uh, erect the towers for the triple loop slide. So they're big, massive towers that are out there. So, again, you start to see things like that coming on board, gets people excited, gets us excited because we know we're getting that much closer uh, to having it uh, open and and ready for people to use. So, see, you get to go down the triple loop slide. I don't think you you can't have your beverage with you, though, but you can go down the triple loop slide, jump out, get your beverage right into the adult swim up. Cool. Okay, so the, the triple loop, can I put it in my Yeti and close the Yeti lid? Can I at least keep it with me? Uh, I don't know. You have to it's frowned, up, the it's frowned upon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, who doesn't want to go to the old uh, Lazy River uh, and, and see Shuey waving at you? It's going to exactly. be great. You'll probably have them divot dogs chipping at me. I'll be the new hippo. <laughs> that might be right. Hey, that's a good idea. I never thought about that. Look at me working part time. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me, man. My side. You see the fat guy in the inner tube? Yeah. Uh, 50 <laughs> bucks. <laughs> 50 bucks, whoever chips it to his, uh, to his temple. <laughs> well, Shuey, we're excited uh, to see what's going on at Wilderness. Thanks for giving us a few minutes recapping the Masters, bud. And uh, best to you guys out there. We'll, we'll get in touch uh, next week. And thanks for spending some time. You bet. Thank you. Everybody stay safe. You too. Mike Shuart with us, Wilderness Ridge. Shuey blew out some birthday candles recently when you see him. Tell him happy 49th and check out the great folks at Wilderness Ridge. We'll wind down hour one. Brandon Ketty, Jabba Chamberlain. Next hour, Hail Varsity continues. Thanks for spending time. Hail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Hope you're doing all right on a Wednesday. We have some 
good drama with Lincoln Baseball out at Dan Hartog. You got a update from our dear friend Doug Duda, a legendary broadcaster with the Tri City ESPN Superstation, and uh, Duda's waiting to uh, to take the booth, <laughs> and they will have it'll be Carney versus Southeast for the semis of the Hack Tournament. And I love watching Southeast's ball club, uh, Max uh, Butenbach, uh, stud ball player, of course, committed to, to Nebraska. They'll have Carney later. Games got pushed back a couple hours because of the weather, which totally makes sense. It's still not ideal baseball weather outside, but it's more doable. But Southwest has rallied. They were down 8-2 to two after 3, and they just had someone thrown out at home. So they didn't take the lead in the eighth, but uh, Southwest and East are tied at nine. East with just uh, one loss on the season, number two in the uh, Class A. So good on, you know, I I cheer for all Lincoln baseball teams, but good on Southwest. Junior's part of that program as uh, their freshman team will take to the field here in about 10 minutes uh, against Creighton Prep. Hmm. So that's that's some some excitement out at Hard Talk, man. But some that's high level baseball, big I mean, time for them. This is most likely going to be going a full. I mean, it's seven innings in high school, but this is like a, an actual baseball go game extra. going nine innings. Oh, Southwest, good ball pro, good ball club, good program as well. East is is really talented, obviously, and so uh, we'll try and keep you posted. That may. We'll see if it alters. Grabbing Jabba at five twenty five. His boy does a great job for Southwest and. Of course, he's a proud dad watching ball. So we'll see where that goes. Who, who is the is East the home team or is Southwest the home team? Are, are I we think, sure? Here? I think it's East. I think okay. they're the home. Okay. I think East was in their uh, their their blue pinstripes today. It'll be interesting to see uh, the difference in Jabba's mood whether Southwest wins here and drama and extra innings or if they get walked. Well, off. it's That's... well walking off sucks. If you lose an extra, it sucks. But it's better than getting run ruled. Have I ever told you the story of whenever I was traveling with the Husker baseball team and? Uh, they got walked off against Iowa, and they abandoned me at the field. The, the team bus left without me. Ooh. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you drank Joe Boo's rum. Maybe you were the problem. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> what, were you doing work, or were you jacking around? Well, no, I was up there trying to put my cameras away, and Iowa starts shooting off fireworks because they just walked off on a Friday night. So all the lights go off, and I'm trying to pack up with the lights off, and Husker Bay's team were out of there. They were in no... How did you get home? Uh, I got a ride home from Greg Sharp and Ben McLaughlin. Oh, good. So. Two great dudes, and God love them. <laughs> and then I told <laughs> Do you have to chip in for gas? <laughs> no, I, I, told the, I told the baseball team I had to Uber home, and they paid me back for the Uber. <laughs> oh, it's a good thing you, you know, divulge. So what is a trip from Iowa City to Lincoln? They give you a couple hundred? Oh, they gave me some some spending money for the weekend. Yeah, some pretty M money. Okay, but I'm saying if you had to Uber home. Oh no, it was like just Uber back to the hotel. We were okay, okay, I see, I see. We I were thought, okay. I thought you were pulling. Uh, no, no, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, help me out, wide out, the wide out. That he went to the the bills, right? Yes, Brandon Riley. That's right, another Southwest kid. Yeah, Riley dropped a lot of coin Ubering to make camp. Reminder to get uh, buckled up with the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. Using your seatbelt saves lives, prevents injuries only if worn properly. This message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. More wideout thoughts. Husker, uh, former Husker Brandon Kenny next. Pardon the interruption, but I'd like to save you some money. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity, and I wanted to offer listeners of this podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we produce, 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's Hale Varsity. Dot com backslash subscribe promo code GBR. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. 
Welcome to it. It's Hour 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, some football thoughts from a man who caught a lot of touchdowns, some big-time games, uh, has done a great bunch of things in the Omaha community. Brandon Kenny is with us, uh, standout wideout, the uh, pride of Kansas City, Missouri, at bkitty 84 on Twitter. BK, what are you doing? How are you? My brother, man, I'm doing well, brother. Thanks so much for having me, man. It's always a blast coming on with you guys, man. Well, it's so much fun to to hear what you're up to, and I, and I saw you were at the spring game. How many reps were yeah. you good for on Saturday? <laughs> you know, so many people kept asking me, like, BK, I think you still got it, man. You can go out there. I'm like, man, I wish, man. My back could give out so fast. <laughs> I, I think you you would be you'd be you'd be solid for a dig route and then a stop and go, wouldn't you? Yeah, easy though. Those two, then I'm done. The rest of the game. <laughs> well, and, and and right, you'd be up fourteen nothing if they did it right. Right, right, well, exactly. I, I got to get your thoughts. I know a, a lot wasn't divulged, but a lot's been talked about with this receiving mm-hmm. crew that's that's come in. And what are your thoughts first and foremost on on Mickey Joseph's addition to uh, to Lincoln, and and then some of the talent he's got to work with in that room. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's awesome, man. I think the camaraderie that he brought uh, with just his name um, has been so big and it's some momentum to carry into the se- I mean, carry into the season. Um, I love the competition that's now in the room even more. Um, you know me, man. I think the last time I was on here, I raved about being an Omar Manning fan, mm-hmm. man, and I still am. I'm just I'm so, – like, I love that dude, man. Like, I really do. And it's just because – and I've never met him or anything, but it's just knowing his story, knowing his background, where he's come from, his size, his play – uh, like, I'm really rooting for him, man. So I'm hoping that he can um, have a huge year. I've seen a route that he posted um, on his Instagram doing one-on-ones, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, man. It was like a big route, but it was like a stop-and-go type of thing. So he has all the tangibles, man, to be amazing. So I hope he, uh, I hope he's able to bring that out this year. Does he remind you of anybody you played with or you see? Because he's, he, he's got size and speed, and he can get open and – you know, Nebraska didn't use him as much as maybe they could have, but you saw him mm-hmm. flash against Michigan. You saw him flash mm-hmm. against mm-hmm. Oklahoma. Who's a who's a, a fair comp for him body type wise? I mean, I would say guys like me, guys like Niles back in the day when we played. Um, I think he has that type of um, a body build to be able to go out there and play. I mean, I, I didn't see Maurice purified play, but that's when I was coming, and that's all I kept hearing about was like, hey. You remind us of him. So once I start seeing his highlights, I'm like, oh, my God, this is a beast. Um, so, but, yeah, that's who, I mean, that's who I see. I see myself in him. Um, but obviously now with, 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 with more developed in coaching and training and things like that, I mean, he has it all, man. He has the tools to really be like the guy, the guy, the guy. So I just hope he takes those steps into being that man before he takes off. Brandon Kenny is with us. Hail Varsity Radio, standout Husker and – of course, uh, BK running athlete sports training, also doing some coaching at uh, Concordia Lutheran in Omaha. Yeah. So I, I got to ask you, you mentioned Omar. Yeah. Let's let's get a thought on, on Trey Palmer and some of the swag he's bringing from LSU. Didn't two catches, 11 yards, but but a speedster. And, mm-hmm. and, and is it fair to say a guy that brings a certain mindset to the, the wide receiver room and the offense? Yes, absolutely. And I, and I think it's one thing, too, to have those type of guys in your room that has been at those different schools, especially being at SEC school. I don't think the transfer stuff was so hot when we were around, but now to be able to, 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 to pick their, those guys' brain and, like, ask questions because that was my thing when I left Nebraska. And once you go to these different places and you plan um, for different teams, you get to talking to these different guys, and it's like LSU and Arkansas, and it's like these teams you watch on TV, so they're just – ask questions about their camaraderie or what things that they did. So I think that absolutely helps uh, with the camaraderie again, but also give a different perspective to these young guys too as well. Brandon Kinney's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Brandon, we were talking a little bit last hour uh, about the importance of Nebraska's 2023 recruiting class. And yeah, the, the transfers and, and the, the guys in the room right now are, are nice, but it, it's not foundation for the future. I guess uh, mm-hmm. th- this roster this year a little bit feels like a, a, a Band-Aid of sorts, uh, just trying to get the, the results back on track. But I want to ask you, with a guy like Mickey Joseph as the wide receivers coach, 
Mm-hmm. What, what would that mean to you if you put your shoes in, or you put yourself in the shoes of a high schooler uh, and you see the guys that Mickey Joseph has coached in Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson and now he's at Nebraska and he wants you to come to Nebraska? What would that mean to you? Oh yeah, I'm 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 like I'm I'm committing right away. <laughs> I was ready to commit when Bo Pelini came to visit me. So if he came to visit me, I'm definitely ready to commit. Uh, but it's something just I feel like again, just being on that type of level and playing in those type of games and to know that a coach um, has played in those. I mean, I'm sorry, coached in those type of games. I think it's like a no brainer when you really think about things like that. All that type of guy in coaching just has to show up and just show his resume. Uh, so. That's something I respect, man, and I think he's going to really bring um, bring up that talent out of that room with just the guys that he's already seen prior and knowing how to really get these guys and get them to kind of take it to the next level. Brandon, what, what do you expect with the, the Whipple offense? I, mean, I think it'll be balanced, but they'll be able to, to throw it with, with Casey and whoever else is you know going to continue mm-hmm. that competition to quarterback, but Casey seems like the guy – you know what? Uh, what what can Nebraska fans expect from the wideouts here in twenty twenty two moving forward? Mm-hmm. I honestly think I hear you, I hear you with being balanced, but I really think they're going to really air it out. To be completely honest with you, and I think even more so. Obviously, spring games you don't really get to see a whole lot. But even when we played, I mean, heck, I felt like you know we did punt returns, we did kick returns, we tackled. It was. It was more of a live thing, but I feel like it was more of a um, plan of Scott to say, you know what, this is how it's going to look. This is what we're going to do. But, like, come season, I think they're just going to air that thing out, man. And I really hope that they do. I want to see these guys really run around, really make some plays and spectacular plays. And I was a little bit, like, not upset, but I was like, really? Can we get something here on the weekend? But it's okay. Like, I, I can wait. I'm obviously I'm, – I'm so fine with waiting, but I – I really hope, man, that this is a, a year that at least gets things back on track. Um, I do agree with um, um, you guys on uh, – I think you have to build the foundation too. Uh, so you do have to get those those high school guys and those kids to get in here and start building that as well. But um, as of right now, you got to use what you got. And I think they have something to at least get the ball rolling. So I'm hoping for the best, man. Randy Kitty is with us, uh, Husker standout wide receiver. We're talking about the wide receiver room. What was your schedule like when you got to Lincoln? How much time did you spend with Lee? How much did you, time did you spend with Team Magic? What were the workouts outside of spring football leading into, mm-hmm. into fall camp? How much throwing was going on? Oh, a lot, man, a lot. I mean, after every workout that we had as a team, um, or if we had weightlifting, our weightlifting group was together, we always got out there. And especially um, the last two years really was like a thing of like, okay, we, we're trying to really get to that next level um, and understand the hard work that goes into it. Um, so we did it a lot, man. It was every chance that we got just to really get that connection down. And it's really important. I, I genuinely think it's really important, but then also doing it um, at a high level so you understand the difference. Um, play once you're in the game, right? So uh, if they're doing that, um, and I believe that they are, because I, I feel like now the generation that we're in, these kids are starting to understand to a, to a certain extent like the hard work that goes into it, the training and things like that, and people are starting to take it more serious. Um, so I'm assuming that they're, those guys are really doing that, and they're feeling the momentum too as well of like, hey, this could be a big year. We just have to put the work in. Okay, you look at the receiver room. Alante Brown got plenty of press. We've touched on Omar and Trey. You have Oliver Martin, Brody Belt, uh, uh, Garcia Castaneda uh, was dinged, so we didn't see much of him this spring. You have Han and uh, a trio of kids from the last recruiting cycle that from uh, from some some hotbed regions, Florida and, uh-huh. and Georgia and Grimes and Hardy and Victor Jones, Latrell Neville. So Mickey wants eight to nine wideouts. There's more than eight to nine guys I've, I've reeled off. In your opinion, does Nebraska have the different receiver types to make it go? Do they have a possession? Do they have a take the top off the, the defense guy? Do they have a in-space not uh-huh. we, uh, you know everyone wants uh, you know a, a, uh-huh. a cheetah type receiver, but uh, yeah, yeah, do they yeah. have that space guy? Does Nebraska have those those three kind of food group guys that can do different things with the football? Yeah, I I think that they do. And when you have a group of, of of that quantity, I mean the coaching it, you you really start to see as well because you can group the guys right on wherever that you think that they are, but now it's just coaching them up and then also giving that confidence, giving them that permission to say, hey, go out and ball like. I believe in you. I know you can do this. We've watched you do it. 
So go do it now. Go be the man. So I believe that they do. Um, and I think the coaching is there to give them boys that confidence to go out there um, and really prove themselves this year and really be the guys that really kind of carry that offense and get that offense at least going. Because I think with a group that large, I, I, I think in my personal opinion, Scott was really like, you know, we're not going to show anything because we got something for y'all. So I'm hoping, man. I'm really hoping. Any thought on Xavier Betts? you think he comes back? I hope that he does because you hate to hear stories like that. And then obviously the speculation that comes with it, uh, you know, we really don't know unless we're in the room. Um, so I'm hoping that he does because these young men need that. Like, right, we, 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 it, it's already tough enough at times with everything that's going on in the world. Um, so I hope that whatever that's going on with him or the program or together that they come to an agreement and figure it out, man, because I think that would be a tough loss being a kid from obviously here in Omaha and being down there. Man, I just think it would be tough. So um, I hope they can figure it out. All right, a couple more minutes left. Brandon Kenny with us. Brandon, tell folks what you, you've, you've gotten into, and uh, let's hear a little bit about uh, Alliance Sports Training. I see videos on, on Facebook all the time of what you're doing, working with kids, and you make it super affordable. Give folks a, a kind of a, a look-see into what you do. Absolutely, man. So Alliance Sports Training, I've started um, about a year ago, about a year and a half ago, and uh, we're getting gearing up to start um, our sports training sessions here at Deal Park in Omaha um, April 26th, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So that'll be from 5 to 6, 3rd through 7th grade, and then 6 to 7, 7 through 12th grade. Um, and like I said, we'll do that three days a week with the options of one-on-one training. Um, and that uh, be um, a situation of all uh, we're trainers and what we can as far as timing and things like that. But it's a growing thing, man. A guy gave it to me as a ministry, man, and I'm treating it as such. Um, it's just reaching back. It's just using your light to reach back. And I feel like um, if we want to make this world a better place, we got to reach back and, and, and pour into our young people, man. So um, I'm just following the steps, man. I'm having fun. I'm enjoying it. It's funny because – I tell people all the time, I never wanted to coach, like ever. I never wanted to do it, ever, ever, ever. It's never something that I thought about. Um, but now it's like one of those things of like God giving you purpose, and I understand what I'm here for now um, is to pour into the youth um, and, 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 to, and to bring these opportunities forth um, that I was able to go through and learn from. So it's been awesome, man. We're planning a, um, some awesome events this summer. Um, it's going to be a good time, man. So I'm so excited, man, to be doing the will of the Lord, but also like um, building up young men and women, man, to be great people. So now, now tell me, is it is it sports specific? Because I know growing up in, in high school as a lineman, I, I was the fat kid, and I wouldn't be able to make it through, through a workout. <laughs> you wasn't you, 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 you wasn't catching the football, uh, uh, BK is what we're saying. So, so what kind of training is it? Is it like is everyone going through the same program, or what do you, what do you have going? Do you on? have it for linemen? Yeah. Is, is this nice <laughs> right. way of asking? <laughs> So uh, we do have so our uh, our group training speech is like a more of an athletic training. So to teach all positions to be on in any sport, we do have specific training in baseball, basketball, and football. Uh, so man, we would be able to get your own line work, man. <laughs> so, uh, but the group speed training absolutely is for plyometric speed, footwork, being agile, being light on your feet, um, just teaching athletes. And we tell our kids all the time, like, hey. Athletes listen to, you know what I'm saying? You don't just get to be an athlete and not listen. Like the athletes listen to and they go out there um, and then they do what they're told and they make plays. So, um, yeah, man, we got it all, brother. Ed Brendan, uh, Ed B. Kitty, 50, uh, 84, 84 on Twitter and find him on Facebook. Last thought, you're a, you're a 500-mile radius guy, i.e. you were in Kansas City, so you knew up mm-hmm. Nebraska. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that important for Nebraska to get back within kind of the Midwest when it comes to recruiting, Brandon? Do you think that's, that's, that's crucial for the Big Red? I think so, and especially in your backyard. Um, I do understand that. You can't get them all. Um, I, I do get that. But I, I think that if you're a kid from Omaha, um, Iowa, um, any part of Nebraska, Kansas City, all these surrounding places, I, I feel like Nebraska has to be that number one option. Or you guys, you know, the guys down there have to be on those radars immediately. Um, so those guys can feel that and understand that, um, especially being here in your backyard here in Omaha. So I know they've done a better job. I know Mickey has been up here a few times recruiting, but – I think that's where it starts. I think Omaha has a great selection of um, athletes as, as well as Iowa and Kansas City. And you got you to gotta clean up your backyard first, man. So I think if they can do that, man, you can really start seeing some foundational work growing in this thing. Brandon, best to you. Uh, keep up the amazing work with uh, Alliance Sports Training. And Absolutely. we'll talk some ball again, but thanks for a few minutes. 
For sure, man. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day. You too. There he is, Brandon Keddy with us, uh, standout Husker wideout. And uh, we'll get next time we talk with BK, we'll, we'll get more into that that bow visit, that sit down, and pretty good stuff. Just uh, just a happy dude, uh, proud uh, husband and father, and and he really loves the training and coaching and, and the ministry stuff he gets to do. So, and you know, really good player. Love getting his perspective, but just learning learning and and hearing more about what he's done after football is really cool. Now, you're going to have to remind me here. We talked about both him and Maurice Purify. who They reminded me of each other, and I was so young watching them that I think I've been in the mix. Which was, which was the you're one that had the— just going to throw shade at BK when he leaves, huh? No, 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 no. <laughs> I just want to know, which one was— Was he the one that had the like the, the freakishly large hands, or is that Purify? I well, know I mean, one of them had freakishly I think they both hands. have large hands if we're talking comparisons, but I think Mo was, Mo was huge. Mo was the Zach Taylor era. He went yeah. up. Against A and M. Yep, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, Mo was yeah, Mo Purify was was big time and Brad and Kenny really good as well. And then you had a a Nunwa mm-hmm. uh, in there as like a younger back to player. Back to back. Like yeah, they did a great job. We'll check in with Jabba next. Pardon the interruption, but I'd like to save you some money. I'm Brandon Vogel, managing editor of Hale Varsity. And I wanted to offer listeners of this podcast ten dollars off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than twenty dollars, can get everything we produce 10 issues of our monthly magazine our annual football yearbook and all the premium content we produce at hailvarsity.com just go to hailvarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code gbr for ten dollars off a full year of hail varsity that's hailvarsity.com slash subscribe promo code gbr Chime in 402-466-ESPN or email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Big thanks to Brandon Kenny for joining us, kind of breaking down the receivers and uh, where they go, what Nebraska has, and uh, how big they could be uh, next season for Nebraska. We'll hear from Jabba once the game concludes. And uh, Dan tweets in uh, when it comes to Mo Purify. Mo is the uh, one that thought snow came up from the ground and was surprised when he saw it fall from the sky. Uh, <laughs> I've Mo never being, heard that. I, I haven't either, but I think Mo was introduced to snow <laughs> when he came to Nebraska. But he was a he was a San Francisco C- Community College CC recruit. I think Ted Gilmore got him, and and Mo was big time uh, just a lot of fun to uh, to cover uh when he was in lincoln just just watch him with with those offenses some big time uh plays so I mean, right yeah, those are my earliest football memories of zach taylor to mo purify in texas a&m yeah and then i mean my dad went down to the the big 12 championship game in kansas city and i was bummed he didn't take me with him but it's okay nebraska lost the game so yeah we we got lucky to to cover that one inside one of the uh the Arrowhead Suites versus being out in the stands because that was the freaking coldest ever. Uh, Duda confirming and second by seconded by Elijah just ended Southwest a thrilling, incredible comeback over Lincoln East at Hartog in the Hack Semis ten to nine in nine innings. So the old Silverhawks got it done. East uh, is still uh, ready to, to run for a, a state championship, uh, but great ball game. Impressive comeback. We'll see if we, we hear back from Jabba or not, but his, his son uh, does a great job playing ball for Southwest on varsity. So pretty big time. Potentially sets up what I think is the, the best rivalry in the capital city, which is Southeast-Southwest, potentially in the hack championship. I know there's a lot of great rivalries in the capital city. I could be a little bit biased there, but – that, that's that been one of the best just in terms of everyone from Southeast knows everyone from Southwest and everyone from Southeast and I mean, vice versa. They want to beat each other. That, that's the the one team all year you want to beat. Well, uh, Carter, Jabba's boy, came in and got the save. Ooh, that's big. That's, that's huge. So there's smiles all about. So happy for Jabba and his family there. So let's talk and stick with pitching. We were going to ask uh, Jabba about this, but... Oh, it's it's been a, a bit of a topic today, and that's the, the Dodgers and what they did or did not do. 
can I quickly just add here? Not only did sorry, just to go no, back, a second, good, not please. only did Carter come in and close the game, he also hit the RBI single that put Southwest on top. Oh man, what a ninth inning! Good for them. Good for Carter Chamberlain. The go ahead RBI and then shut the door. So Clayton Kershaw gets pulled after seventy pitches against the Twinks, and he gets taken out. He gets taken out while throwing a perfect game. Not a no-hitter, but perfect game. He was six outs away. Yes, there's outrage. And we know Kershaw in the postseason. We know Kershaw's injury history. We know the Dodgers are expected to do it again. We know their payroll's incredible and Kershaw's magic to watch. Uh, Good tweet here by Jeff Passan of ESPN. There's been more than 220,000 games in Major League Baseball history. There's been 23 23 perfect games. And the pitch count is, is 80. I think that is your pitch count. He's at 70. What say you? Put your skipper hat on. Would you have pulled him? Yay or nay? And the the feedback's pretty good. People act like Kershaw's arm would have fallen off the bone if he pitches two more innings. Uh, Imagine being the fans, freezing your off to watch that game. (laughs) Realizing, okay, I've kind of hit the baseball lottery in early season. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, The other side of that here is ask Mets fan, Johan Santana, was allowed to throw 134 pitches to get his first no-no for the Mets. Well, Santana came back from injury, was really good early with the Twins, went to the Mets, finished that year 3-7 and with an 8.27 ERA, his next 10 starts before being shut down and uh, never pitched in the majors again. Was it worth it? That's an extreme case. And then there's Nolan Ryan, the bionic man. He threw 235 pitches in a 13-inning no decision. Went six scoreless three days later. Pitched 17 more seasons. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Nolan, Ryan, Nolan Ryan could still go out and throw a 95-mile-per-hour heater. Well, did you hear Clayton Kershaw's comments after the game? He said he agreed with, uh, with well, Robert's he decision. Was, he was high-fiving, and he... Listen, you're taking the, the guy who had, has the, the most important take his opinion out of it. And Kershaw is a team guy. He was high five and he was happy that in those conditions that he was so on point. Right. So he wasn't ticked. He's not going to challenge Roberts. He's okay. He wants to just win. But on the other hand, could be the last real chance that Clayton Kershaw has in his career to throw up a, a perfect game. I mean, th- these don't come around opportunities like this where you go seven perfect innings. That doesn't come around very often in the majors. Mm. Could this be the last chance he ever gets to do it? Maybe. And then that's a very elite list to be a guy who has thrown a perfect game. I don't think I'm pulling him out. Well, Dodgers don't enter the year to, with the goal of getting Kershaw a perfect game and overuse him two weeks into the year. Uh, the goal is to a World Series. Listen, I would have kept him in, despite his injury history, until he gave up a hit. Once the no-no's gone, you sit him. And if you're shy of that 80 pitch pitch count, 10 more pitches, I mean, that's what, 10 pitches a, an inning? He's been dealing. I'd let, him, I'd let him go for it. I hope there was collaboration between manager and pitcher in this situation when he came to the dugout after the seventh inning and, and, and said, How much do you care about well, this? Because I, I want to pull you out. How much do you care? I hope there was collaboration there and it wasn't just a heavy handed Dave Roberts saying, You dude, know what, you're it, done. No, the, the, the manager. Either there's a zero tolerance rule going into this season of here's what we're going to do for your career and in, in, in safety and health and well-being. So no arguments, sorry, no excuses, no exceptions. This is what we're doing. If, if that was agreed upon in the case, so be it. You, you follow it. You don't you don't cross that line. But. You're not going to ask the guy, hey, do you want to stay in? Do you got any more in you? You know what he's going to say. He's going to say yes. So just 
I think it's a bad look for baseball because you got people that are ticked at baseball, and you had the uh, the saga of the lockout. You, you have New York fans going nuts that Judge isn't going to take that type of an extension. Just a, another storyline, right? You've got young talent that's really good, but maybe not as durable as some throwbacks. We've cited Nolan Ryan, a, a miracle. Uh, example of modern science, but I don't know. I would have left him in, let him finish what he started, and at least let him broach that that pitch count. And if someone's got to come in because of the pitch count to finish, then you go to the bullpen and do it. Most important thing, first and foremost. Uh, is to win the ball game. See if we can find some some Kershaw or some Roberts uh, with our friends at ESPN. But no, I mean y- you have a missed opportunity, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I, I think you let him go. I think you let him go until either he breaks the pitch count number or he gets a hit off of him and. Um, it's as simple as that. But baseball and the Dodgers and uh, Roberts being trashed right now. Numbers to get in, 466-377-6800-825-5865. Find anybody in your little baseball circle that would have pulled him? I don't know that I could have. I don't know that I would have. And uh, a little bit more here on Kershaw, the Dodgers, and the uh, the perfect game that was going uh, seven innings strong. It's hard, you know. I feel bad for uh, for Barnsey. You know, Barnsey did such a great job, and it's fun to get to catch one of those. And so I, I wanted to do it with Barnsey. You know, um, it'd be special. And but at the end of the day, those are those are individual things. Those are those are selfish goals, and we're trying to win. You know, and um, that's that's really all we're here for. Good take. Can't argue. One more from Kershaw. As much as I would have wanted to do it, I've, I've thrown 75 pitches in a sim game, you know, and I hadn't gone six innings, let alone seven. And um, sure, I would have loved to have do it, but, um, you know, maybe we get another chance. Who knows? <laughs> There's always the next outing, right? <laughs> 13 strikeouts, seven innings, perfect baseball, shutout intact. And uh, when we look at the, uh, the, the box score that's talked about, uh, just one hit. <laughs> just one hit. The, the Twins have managed one hit. And this isn't to pile on Twins fans. But, man, you were right there. And it was Gary Sanchez, the former Yank, the catcher, batting a whopping two twenty two, that got the hit off of Kershaw. You ever uh, umped a, a no-hitter? You know, it's not really the, the top of mind. I, I think yes, but never like... Uh, Wasn't cognizant where that zone's going to keep on expanding? Yeah, I'm not I'm not really monitoring how a game is going unless we're getting close to like a run rule situation. I'm, I'm not monitoring score. I'm not monitoring hits and whatnot. So prob- I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if there's ever been a situation where we got a full like seven innings in high school no hitter. Because mm-hmm. I've, I've had it before where it's been like a run rule after four and a half innings where... The kid's only gone out and pitched, you know, five innings. So, sure. so it, can you really count that as a no-hitter? I, I would say yes, but maybe not like an actual. I mean, and also, I don't have all the, the scorebooks handy from every game I've ever umpired. So. No, well, I'm just wondering <laughs> if you've been, you know, part of that. If... I, never a perfect game. Uh, I can almost guarantee never a perfect game, but there's a chance for a no-hitter. All right. Well, we'll uh, get an update on, on Luca in the NBA playoffs. Get going this weekend at Jock Doc, Dr. Ben Woodhead with Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Some baseball here as Kershaw got pulled, was okay with it. The Twins muster a one-hitter, and uh, they break up the perfect game and the no-hitter. But Kershaw able to get that uh, elbow in the ice below his pitch count. You heard from Kershaw there. And uh, we'll continue on a Wednesday with Hale Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. 
Like what you hear? High quality radio and podcast is part of what we do at Hale Varsity. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity Radio, and I wanted to offer listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we produce, 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe, promo code GBR. He's in his 30s, but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hail Varsity Radio. I got the body of a taut, preteen Swedish boy. Back into it, it's Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Time for a Jock Doc Wednesday with Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Dr. Ben Woodhead with us. Dr. Ben, you, you got the turtleneck out for some, some uh, air quote, spring golf. How you doing? I'm doing good. I know we're about half to with how the weather's going. Or a rain jacket. Yeah, no kidding. You need something or all of the above and then the electric socks. Uh, let's talk NBA playoffs. And you've got uh, the stud for the Mavericks, Luka Doncic is dinged up an MRI confirming he's got a left calf strain. There's no timetable on the recovery. The Mavs haven't ruled him out for game one against Utah, but he is major. He's such a a matchup nightmare for other teams. Let's dive into calf strains and how you get them and and how you treat them. Yeah. So, you know, you can strain any type of muscle or any type of tendon. Just a lot of it depends on the forces and, you know, the type of injury. This is a difficult injury though, because, you know, these don't necessarily have a surgical solution or a quick fix in terms of getting them better, but these are something that can nag for a very long time. And so, um, you know, best case scenario in the sense that he doesn't have to have anything surgically done, but sometimes that can be more frustrating because you sit and you wait. You do sit and wait and you just, you want to give it a go and then oops, maybe you make it worse. Right. Right. Absolutely. So it's almost the false pretense that you, you get going, you feel good and then you tweak it again and it sets you back. It's even further. So it's almost, you know, two steps forward and one step back and you never really get to the point where you're full throttle because you go back too early. And so that's something they're going to have to monitor as they go forward. When we talk about strained calves, how, when we, when we talk about different muscle strains, how uh, likely or, or, I guess, easy is it to re-injure that part of the body versus some other muscle strains? Is this a worse muscle to deal with? Well, it's a tough one to deal with because you're using it so much, run and jump and cut and pivoting. And so, you know, you're going to notice this almost somewhat more than an overhead type of strain, especially unless you're an overhead athlete, but somebody that that is in his position, it's certainly going to be vital. And so, you know, it also, it is concerning, like you said, that, um, you know, you tweak it and then it does set you back. You're certainly going to be more susceptible to re-injuring it until you're fully recovered. Um, the hard part is kind of figuring that time frame of when you're really fully a hundred percent and ready to go back. So you don't re-injure it again. Donkic has been wearing a protective boot on that left foot. Uh, able to walk into the hospital under his own power Monday for that MRI. And does the way he tweaked this say much to you? He grabbed his calf after jumping to throw a pass and asked for time out. Yeah, I mean, he he certainly he certainly probably aggravated to a severe degree. Um, you know, when he does that, I'm sure there's some bleeding in there. There's some straining of the muscle that you know causes a tremendous amount of inflammation that does make weight bearing certainly running very difficult. Um, and it's really a time thing that's going to wait and allow that to calm down. Luka Doncic, our topic, the Mav, uh, not sure if he'll give it a go against Utah in uh, game one for the NBA playoffs. It's a Jock Doc Wednesday, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Dr. Ben Woodhead with us. So we're talking about uh, calf injuries and 
uh, ways you treat it. Dr. Ben, what's, what's, uh, what are some ways you treat aside from rest? Yeah, I mean, rest is obviously the number one, not aggravating it. So in between games, really not doing anything. He's not going to be doing anything other than walking in that boot. But beyond that, ice elevation, decreasing the swelling. There's all kinds of new different physical therapy modalities that you use to treat the swelling and the inflammation components, whether it consists of using some uh, fancy ultrasound machines or some other types of um, electrostimulation to kind of help break up maybe some of that scar formation so it doesn't scar too much or decrease the inflammation that's really the point that that we're at is trying to limit the amount of um scarring and inflammation so that he can return and you know if he does try and go back out there and play it's certainly you know we're in the playoffs and so they're just trying to get him back in as safely as possible so he can function as close to 100 percent as he can dr ben when it comes to the options the ultrasound the other stimulations is that a pretty popular choice when it comes to the pt options yeah it certainly is and you know they're going to throw everything possible they can at him to try and accelerate the healing process so even if there's some maybe you know, different modalities that are not as proven you can bet that they're going to try everything possible um, just to try and accelerate the healing even if some of them don't work the best thing you can do is just try and really accelerate the healing process does that work? Have you seen it happen? It's better than nothing, obviously, but these these newer uh, PT options, have they been pretty effective in your opinion? Yeah, I think they certainly are effective. You know, the regular um, kind of weekend warrior doesn't always have access to the type of treatment modalities that these high-end athletes are. So we don't always see some of the newer, fancier types of um, treatment options that these professional athletes are using, but, but yeah, it certainly does. Um, and, you know, and just combine it with parking him and not letting him <clears throat> really do any type of running or jumping in between games is going to help his uh, healing as well. From an explosiveness standpoint, is, is it fair to say, even if he's cleared and back, is he going to be a step slower too? Yeah, I certainly think he will in the short term, um, whether he's able to power through that um, and just function like he's um, normal, you know, that's kind of up to him in terms of his pain tolerance. But I certainly think that he will have a little bit uh, less pep in his step until he fully heals. Dr. Ben Woodhead's with us, a Jock Doc Wednesday, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. As uh, we're talking uh, Luka Doncic and the calf strain, how painful is this? I mean, uh, is it one of the more painful areas to, to tweak and injure? Uh, what, what could you compare it to, and, and what have you heard back from many athletes? Yeah, I think a lot of these strains are very painful just from the actual swelling and bleeding that takes place uh, when you injure it. And I think the lower extremity can be even more painful than the upper extremity just because it's what you're using uh, on a daily basis. You know, while he's in the boot, he's not firing the muscles as much as if he were running um, or jumping or anything like that. But I think a lot of us, you know, we take for granted these types of muscles and the function they provide because, you know, when you're not injured, you're not thinking about it. But then when you realize the daily activities that you can't even do when you have a big strain like this, it really affects you, let alone somebody that is has to perform at tip-top performance, you know, is the, is the calf muscle one of those muscles that, that always has to be going or can it d- does it uh, get out of shape for lack of a better term quicker than other muscles uh, it's hard to say if it'll get out of shape more than other muscles but he certainly might get a little atrophy over the next couple of weeks uh, if he's not using it in a boot but he is uh, he's a strong enough guy where he should come back pretty quick from that Dr. Ben thanks for the insight today we'll do this again thanks a lot Chris there's Dr. Ben talking Luka Doncic with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt packing up, headed to his son's baseball game. So I'll be taking you through the final segment of Hale Varsity Radio coming up after the break. Like what you hear? High quality radio and podcasts are just part of what we do at Hale Varsity. I'm Brandon Vogel, managing editor. I wanted to offer listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you, for less than $20, can get everything we do. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all of the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe 
and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hail Varsity. That's hailvarsity.com slash subscribe, promo code GBR. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at hailvarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One last time here as uh, it's Elijah Herbal taking you through the final segment of this edition of Hale Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt off a little bit early uh, going to go see his son play some baseball this afternoon against Creighton Prep. Good luck uh, to the uh, Silverhawks freshman team as uh, we'll get the show wrapped up here uh, with some Husker softball thoughts as uh, they have won 15 straight games after winning two against Iowa yesterday. And a pretty incredible story here as Caitlin Neal, uh, she got a chance to bat with uh, the bases loaded in game one of that doubleheader against Iowa. And uh, I'll just let Rhonda Ravel uh, tell you the story as uh, she spoke to the Big Ten Network after the game yesterday about what an incredible story Caitlin Neal had yesterday. Well, you know, I I could talk about the game, but I'm not going to talk about the game because I think this is really important. The beauty of the collegiate experience and the team experience and just what these young women experience with this. Let me just tell you, today, Caitlin Neal, her father passed away in the in the fall today is his birthday her whole team knows that they've encircled her when that she said i'm playing for my dad and when that ball left the bat and hit that building we all knew what it was all about so i just i just want to say you know this is this this experience as a collegiate student athlete and this team experience is nothing like they'll ever experience again and it's really a beautiful thing when it works that way it's a cool story there as Caitlin Neal hits a home run uh, in honor of her father as the Husker softball team wins two yesterday. They have won 15 straight. They are on a roll, and uh, good luck to the Husker softball team as they continue their season. Uh, they've been incredible. Really, the, the women's sports in Nebraska have been incredible all year long from uh, volleyball to women's basketball exceeding some expectations this year. Now the Husker women's softball team on a roll. It's just been a banner year for Husker women's sports and what has been a down year for the men's teams as uh, the Husker baseball team looking to bounce back this weekend against BYU. First three starters have been announced for the Huskers as it's going to be Cody Frank pitching tomorrow. He gets the nod and then in game one of the doubleheader on Friday, Shea Shannon going to get the start and then in game two of the doubleheader on Friday, it's going to be Emmett Olsen. The Saturday pitcher is still to be announced. It's usually... Excuse me. Usually been Dawson McCarville in that uh, that final game of the weekend roll, that Sunday roll, if you will. But with no Sunday game this week, still no pitcher announced for the Saturday game. We'll get you uh, an announcement on that as soon as we know. As we're going to get some more Husker baseball thoughts tomorrow. Hoping to get Jabba Chamberlain locked in for a little bit later this week, maybe Friday. Uh, we'll be uh, talking to Jabba. What we will see as uh, we still have uh, a good two shows coming up to end the week here on Hale Varsity Radio. If you missed anything from today, we talked with Mike Babcock, his thoughts from the spring game, as well as some recruiting thoughts from Mike Babcock back in hour one, as well as Mike Schuhart, as we got Mike's thoughts on the Masters. As uh, we, know, we heard a couple days ago from Chris Elgert that uh, – it was Scotty Scheffler playing at Wilderness Ridge just a couple of years ago. Uh, we talked to Mike about that as he is uh, out at Wilderness Ridge uh, giving us an update on all things happening out there. Leading off hour one, we had former Husker wide receiver Brandon Kinney giving us his thoughts from the spring game. He was in town checking out all the action on Saturday, and uh, we talked to him leading off hour one. And uh, all those interviews going to be available on ESPNLincoln.com in podcast form. Full show also going to be available on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, uh, even the Hale Varsity YouTube page. So however you like to listen to Hale Varsity Radio, we've got that for you. And the, uh, the full show should be posted here shortly after the show, as well as all of those interviews. We'll be back in tomorrow as uh, Chris Schmidt is back. We'll get an update on what the uh, Southwest Freshman team did. That's coming up at 4 o'clock tomorrow here on Hale Varsity Radio. A Huda Media Production.